As the Sinclair Spectrum in all its 128K Amstrad glory was nearing the end of its life, the three big hitting magazines that covered its games were finding new ways to keep themselves afloat. The biggest of which was repeatedly offering an insane amount of games for free on monthly cover cassette tapes. These tapes would often contain full games that were considered either end of life by the publishing houses, playable demos of upcoming games, and more importantly for the purpose of this video, exclusive full games unique to the magazine. These exclusive games would either be games that publishers didn't decide to release commercially for whatever reason, single game developers sending their games in for a bit of extra cash, or just plain old readers games looking for a bit of glory. Sometimes it was even because software houses ran out of money and went out of business. But were these exclusive games any good? Do you remember playing any of them? Well, I think, if my research hasn't failed me, I have played them all. Yep, I spent a chunk of my Christmas holidays playing over a hundred of what can only be called an interesting mix of games that appeared across one of the three magazines between the late 80s and early 90s. I say interesting because cover tapes really went nuts as a desperate last grasp at keeping readers buying the magazines in the late days of the Spectrum's life. See, by this time, with 128K machines out and experienced programmers knowing how to squeeze everything out of the Speccy, games had to be really good to stand out from the crowd. And a lot of these exclusive games often looked good on the surface, but had bad game physics or mechanics that sucked any joy the game gave you visually. Readers would send in games for cash, I presume, but so would wannabe game designers looking to tout their wares with information pages about them and other games they had to offer. Andy Remick from Berry, for example, popped up all over the place. He gave his home address up in the hope he wanted a part with 15 quid to buy more games. I blurred it out as nowadays it just doesn't seem right to post it on YouTube, even though I highly doubt he lives there anymore. This Greek lad, Theo Devig. Devigligus, Develegus, I'm sorry mate, I've, I've no idea how you pronounce your surname. He wins though, as he used his games as a pen pal service most of the time. Check out this intro to one of his games called Bombed. I presume that's him. He would often write about what he'd been up to. In this game, he even has mentions for specific people, which you can read if you know the password. So yes, lots of shit to wade through, and wade through it I did. Occasionally something like this ocean game might pop up and I'd get all excited until I played it and realised why it was given away. This one for example even had a big advertising run but was never published. After playing it I can see why, despite some of the big names attached to it. So after wading through I managed to find some gems and that's what we're going to look at today. It's a top 10, well actually a top 12 as I couldn't decide between a few of them, finally revealing what I think is the greatest exclusive cover game to ever grace us lucky specky owners. Now to be exclusive the game must never have gone on sale, on its own or part of a pack. Batty, I'm looking at you here. And it must have been given away with either your Sinclair, Sinclair user or Crash Magazine before they closed their doors sometime in 1993. Before we begin, I would love to know if you played any of these games or any others that I haven't mentioned that were special to you back in the day. I've played them all, so I would love to know your thoughts and if I dropped the ball somewhere. A turnip wearing big gloves, according to Mark in Crash Magazine, Seymour firmly took over the reins from Dizzy in the later days of Codemasters puzzle platformers for the Speccy. What I love about Seymour, and something that I cover when I look at his games more closely, is the common sense that prevails in most of the puzzles that are put in front of you. This is illustrated beautifully here in this charming little mini game which, although possible to complete in just over two minutes, is still fun enough to make this list. The premise is simple, make and star in a film where you must rescue the damsel in distress who is tied to a train track, although you put her there in the first place, but we'll ignore that. You have to then develop the film so you can watch the end result at the end of the game. This took me a few games to time the start of the camera and not getting the damsel killed, but I got there in the end, and immediately wanted to play more Seymour games, which I guess is the point of this one. So it's a winner winner all round.
Made with the full intention of being the first of a trilogy, it alludes to the sequel in the end game screens apparently, this is in fact the only Spectrum game finished by the pair, who rather nicely make an appearance alongside their game and small bio. Apparently taking seven months to write on a mixture of plus twos, plus D disk drives and various assembler and graphic packages, it's a game obviously inspired by the rather excellent and obviously more polished Exelon some two years earlier. But comparisons aside, this fares very well for a cover game. Now there's some nonsense about retrieving lost documents across four levels left behind by space pirates, but there are over a hundred screens to explore if Crasher to be believed. And explore I did, for longer than I should have done. Although there are some obvious issues with colour clash and object sizing, some jumps for example look perfectly fine until you realise where the actual edge of the object is. This is a really nice looking platform shooter that has nice big well animated sprites with some tough scenarios to overcome if you are to progress even through some of the early screens on level 1. The sound is lacking and I had some issues loading it unless I selected 48k models in my emulator, but this is a smashing little game that I will return to. It's just a shame the two authors didn't get a chance to write anything else together. Two games at number 9 and you'll see why I couldn't separate them. Both written by Mike Westlake who had some 4 years earlier had this game you can see here, Merlin published by Firebird. Mixed reviews were the order of the day for this one but there was some generous praise in amongst the Jet Set Willy comparisons, yes really, for the lovely big sprites from some of the reviewers. It seems only one mahusive sprite based game was enough for the commercial market, so his next two, shall we say, very similar games were seemingly only taken on by Sinclair User. Now, there may be some reasons why. Firstly, yes, the attribute clash is some of the worst you will see, largely down to the big size of everything. Secondly, in both games, so many items just insta kill you. In SAS, it's everything. Whereas pieces of 8, some things are instant and some things take some of the damage displayed at the bottom of the screen off you. I guess this makes SAS harder, but it also makes it feel slightly unfinished. There's no lives check or nothing here mate. I do prefer the premise of the SAS one though, collecting grenades in Downing Street like a boss, whilst all the while alarm clocks and other innocuous household items try and kill you. Grenades are the last of the PM's worries honestly. But it's still really fun playing a Spectrum game with bigger sprites than Benny Hill. Stupid flick screen deaths aside, this game, or games, just struck a chord with me and I really enjoyed them. If, after already seeing a rather excellent Exelon inspired game, you were crying out for a Cybernoid one, well you're in luck with number 8 in our chart, Ethnopod. Another one-off from its creator, Paul Angel, pictured here in another excellent bio piece in your Sinclair, it's one of those games that as soon as you see the screenshots you want in. Not seemingly so for Paul though, who failed to get this published, much to your Sinclair's delight. It's a frustrating little shit of a game, but I honestly couldn't put it down. For example, the annoying mechanics of the elephant trunk shooter things requires patience and timing, but it's worth persevering. The keys are fiddly and sadly not definable, but they are put that way just in case you have a friend to play with to huddle over your plus two. Sadly I don't, but the second player can join in as a little guy who can run around and help out in pretty much the same way. It's a cracking little game that plays pretty decent with no nasty surprises like some flick screen shooters have. A few years earlier and this game would have certainly been picked up by any of the publishers. Certainly one of the budget ones and maybe some full price ones too if it managed to just have a bit more in the sound department. The Shaw brothers, George here being one of them, were nothing short of prolific in turning out games at the tail end of the Spectrum's life. They had some success with publishing houses, and those games that didn't succeed ended up like this one in magazines like Crash. This one is by far my favourite though, 
just because it's a little different. Basically, you have to win the cup by winning each round of uh, quiz-related football. First, you have to win a tackle, which is fairly easy. Then, select a topic for some brilliant, nostalgic, current for the game type questions. Get that right and you pass to the next player and so on until you score, or you get a question wrong. Once you have done a topic, you have to select another, though, which makes things trickier with the timings, and also answering quickly means better attacking passes. It can be annoying getting the timing wrong when you are through on goal, but generally I had a blast with this one, even if my 80s general knowledge is not quite up to scratch. I even got some music questions wrong for flip's sake. If you've heard of the James Bond Spectrum bundle that Amstrad did, then you've heard of Divide by Zero as they were responsible for the James Bond games that were included in it to show off the light gun that was also in the box. Other than that, the ceasefire games, there were only two of them, are pretty much it for this lot and both games appeared exclusively as full cover tape games. Very little to choose between both games honestly, but I preferred the premise and the control system a little more in the second one. It takes a bit of getting used to and can sometimes feel clunky standing in the middle of the screen trying to pick up or drop something. Graphically though, the game is very good. The monotone appearance is always a good bet for me for Spectrum games and everything here is crisp and well defined. The only real disappointment is the rather lame bullet physics. Getting shot by a bad guy? You'd never know as bullets don't show up on the screen as they did in the first game which is maybe down to the nighttime depiction, who knows. Still, a good looking puzzle adventure with plenty to offer for just a cover game, although this was one of those cheeky cash cow prize games the magazines did from time to time. Wanna play it as soon as you got home? Yeah, sure, but first work out the cryptic clue to crack the password. This one was the fourth letter, also a river, unravels Morse's words. Yeah, I have no clue now, let alone when I was a nipper. But don't worry, you can either wait for the password to be printed in the next issue or call a premium number to get help with it now. I wonder how long they kept you on the line, cheeky buggers. Oh, and the answer? The word decode, of course. With a few published games under Jim Gardner's belt, including US Gold's beachhead follow-up Heavy Metal, this was obviously sent to all the magazines and featured as a rather good game in a Your Sinclair Reader's Game article. But it was in fact Crash Magazine that ran with the game as a cover tape. On appearance it looks just like another shoot 'em up and it kind of is. Very smooth scrolling with varied backdrops, preserved power ups that you keep when you die, and only death by alien shots rather than the aliens themselves make this one a joy to pick up and play. I didn't notice any big slowdowns with lots going on in the screen, and yeah, average sound effects and busy backdrops can make bullets hard to see, but I would have happily paid a budget game price for this and get a few hours out of it. Quite an early title this one, using Sinclair user's mascot at the time, Kamikaze Bear, as the playable character, this Pengo clone is tons of fun to play, although lacking in any originality, it holds up because the simple premise is pretty addictive. There are a few ways to kill the enemies, known as dopes, the obvious one is splatting them with a push box, but you can electrocute them on the outer fence or destroy their nests too. I rated this game higher than some of the more graphically impressive games on offer here just purely because I had a blast playing it. It runs at a decent pace and gives a pretty good challenge to the player. Some Spectrum royalty involved with this one with Christian Urquhart, he of Hunchback and Daley Thompson's Decathlon fame. 
This game was published by a software house called Destiny who got as far as sending out review copies of the game, putting full page colour ads in the magazines, as well as having a competition to get a copy of the game, unless you won the Mr Game Show top prize here. I can feel myself going down another rabbit hole getting older one of these. The game received a mixed bag of reviews with interestingly the highest rating coming from the magazine that picked the game up for its cover tape. So why exclusive you ask? Well, Destiny went bust and the game was never released, which is a yay for us I guess because this cracker makes our top three. Based on a fictitious futuristic game show hosted by the annoyingly smug Bobby Yaz, there are a number of frustratingly fun games for you and your spaceship. From simply trying to colour all the squares whilst avoiding nasties and items that screw you over, it's tear your hair out gameplay at times, but incredibly rewarding when you manage to complete levels. All the while Bobby and his team give you cheers of encouragement or just laugh when you die. Cheers Bobby. Levels are mixed up with variations on a similar theme, with paths to be found through blind courses or a simple Pac-Man style key collection. You can tell money was thrown at this one. It very much feels like a premium game. It looks great, has very snappy controls, great sound and is all round great fun. I probably played this for longer than any other game here which says something. Highly recommended. If you played a lot of Spectrum games back in the day, there's a high chance you played a game involving one of these three. From Cobra to Cabal and plenty in between, there is some serious talent on show here from Special FX. Now rumour has it Joffa Smith whipped this game out in around five days, which if true is somewhat proficient. Perhaps just written as a demo concept originally and then quickly made it into a full game to offer to magazines, who knows? but it's certainly a title that stands above most of the builds that was offered exclusively on cover tapes. Very much in the mould of Defender and like Drop Zone, you control a little guy with a jetpack. On the map below, like Defender, you will see pods that need picking up and returning to the central HQ. And that's it, split over four levels with various enemies trying to thwart you along the way. It's very arcadey in its pick up a playability. I was going great guns very early on, which always makes me enjoy a game so much more when I can jump straight in. Monotone colours are a shame, but I get it on the Spectrum. The menu music is awesome, which you get to experience after a little advertising, and in-game sound effects are probably the best I saw on any of the games I played here. Nice clear layout of the lives and the amount of pods to collect, and you got yourself a very nice looking and sounding game. Gameplay is very fast with nice enemy explosions using your jetpack style lasers. I recently got an Antrobinic RG353, if that's how you say it, little handheld device that can play Spectrum games, and this type of game works perfectly for it. I'd play for a bit, put it down, sit there, and then pick it up again. Even Joffa's throwaway games were something to admire, and being free on a cover tape makes this game even more admirable. I was super stingy on what I would part my money for back in the specky days, but even I would have felt good value if I'd spent $2.99 on this, let alone free with a magazine. It was actually so good they gave it away twice by repeating it on a cover cassette some two years later. Nice. David Box was responsible for contributing towards the Ocean Games WWF WrestleMania and the movie time for Darkman. Do you remember that? There's a light that shines on every human being. But one. From director Sam Raimi. Darkman. Other than that, this was his next biggest game. Pixie the Microdot started life as a typing game in your Sinclair that fitted into just 14k. Obviously wanting to take the game to the next level, David wrote the sequel, aptly named 
Pixie the Microdot 2. So what's so special about this one? Well, it's so unique. Yes, it's a platformer in the style that so many games before and after it adopted, but it's the main character and its movement that makes this so much more interesting. You play as uh, a dot. The movement is weird and a little frantic to get used to, but once you do, there is a definite sense of satisfaction when you manage to successfully plot your course around an exit guarding baddie. The plot is a fairly generic collect the insert missing item name here type affair, and on the surface the map looks like every other game in this genre, but to sail that would and not actually play it would be an injustice. The map is pretty huge, which this reader's map proves, and some of the exits to different screens can be quite tricky. You do start off with a whopping 99 lives though, and these can be diminished super quickly if you're not careful. Sometimes the flick screens can lead to instant death depending on how you enter them, but generally the game is fair. The dot is constantly moving around, so you have to concentrate on the breast routes around some of the enemies or terrain. It really is challenging, but not in a massively frustrating way. I had quite a few goes where I lost all of my 99 lives and felt like I got quite far in, but didn't feel deflated enough to give up on it like I would in some other games. Best graphics in this list? Hell no. Best sound? Well that's a no too. Best gameplay? I gotta say no again, but the overall package is unique and quirky enough to make this little gem stand above the others and take the crown as my favourite exclusive offering. Thanks for watching.